Okay. Uh, just trying to set the screen a little bit here. Okay, uh, welcome to a random walk down Mill Street. Thank you to our sponsor, Sherry Miller, who has sponsored this week's session in honor of Carla Solomon Shine. I mention Carla's maiden name because we will, at the very end of tonight's topic, talk a little bit about her family. Uh, and so uh, I hope that uh, you'll enjoy that. Um, and the topic for this evening is about candles in the synagogue. And our starting off point uh, is a quote from a visitor, a non-Jewish visitor to the synagogue uh, in Mill Street in New York uh, in the colonial period, I think 1744. I have a little quote from his uh, itinerary. He wrote it up and published it. Uh, it's not the most flattering, but it does say something interesting that I want to explore a little bit. Okay. So in September of 1744, uh, the Mill Street Synagogue was visited by a man named Dr. Alexander Hamilton, who was not um, the uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, patriot uh, that we know from the revolution. This is an earlier figure. He was a doctor. I think he was from Maryland. Uh, and he was an interesting uh, person, an intellectual kind of person, involved in a lot of things. Right on the right here, you can see uh, his self-portrait. And that's Dr. Alexander Hamilton's self-portrait. Um, anyway, in September of 1744, which is close to uh, you know, the high holiday season, uh, he uh, uh, visited Sheriff Israel's Mill Street Synagogue in Lower Manhattan. And here's what he said. I went in the morning to the Jew synagogue where was an assembly of about 50 of the seed of Abraham chanting and singing their doleful hymns. They had four great wax candles lighted as large as a man's arm round the sanctuary where was contained the Ark of the Covenant and Aaron's rod. I don't exactly know if he is trying to make, uh, you know, if he's just talking about what he sees, being, calling it the Ark of the Covenant, which it's not. It's the Ark that holds the Torah. Or if he's, you know, uh, aggrandizing what he saw to things that he re reads about in the Torah. I don't know. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, four great, uh, there were, there were 50, uh, 50 people praying, dressed in robes of white silk, talitot. Before the rabbi, who was elevated above the rest in a kind of desk, staying on the teba, stood the seven golden candlesticks transformed into silver, silver gilt. Uh, by this, he means the, the uh, menorah. I don't think there was a menorah, but there must have been some kind of candlestick, candelabrum, either on or near the teba, which he interprets as being the menorah. Like in the temple, he sees something in the synagogue that relates to that. They were all slipshod. I guess they were not uh, as uh, well-made as he would have imagined. The men wore their hats in the synagogue, opposed to what we see in church, and had a veil of some white stuff, which they sometimes threw over their heads in their devotion. I assume that means the talit as well. The women, of whom some were very pretty, stood up in a gallery like a hen coop. They sometimes paused or rested a little from singing and talked about business. My ears were so filled with their lugubrious songs that I could not get the sound out of my head all day. Uh, so he wasn't so impressed with the singing. But I do want to just focus on the candles that he uh, noted. I mean, there, he, he notes a lot of things, but one of the things he notes were the great wax candles that he saw inside the synagogue. Uh, uh, and so he took note of that, as large as a man's arm, very large candles that lit the synagogue. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's our starting off point. So if you, uh, we don't have any images of the interior of the, uh, of the Mill Street Synagogue. There is, from an old map, uh, dating from around this period actually, a picture of the exterior of the synagogue, but there are no contemporaneous images of the interior of the Mill Street Synagogue. So we have to imagine it based on what we know about the Mill Street Synagogue. And uh, thankfully, we have many objects from the Mill Street Synagogue. And so we know that there were indeed large candlesticks which we have today in what we call the Little Synagogue. And here's a picture of the Little Synagogue. Um, and you can see 
there's four candlesticks here around the Teba, and two more in the front. These are original from the Mill Street Synagogue. And there are two different types here. You'll see these four have this very big base. And then these two in the front are uh, standing on uh, kind of a thin uh, pole uh, and have a different, uh, different stand than the ones that are around the table. But you can see that these are candlesticks made for a very large candle. And uh, the history of these candlesticks, actually these are some of the oldest, maybe the oldest objects that we know of, because we know that they predate the 1730 synagogue. They were already in use uh, in the rented home that was uh, used before the building of the very first synagogue building in 1730. Now, when I was a child, on pedestals, yes. When I was a child, uh, if you were gonna get a tour of the synagogue, uh, the tour guide might point out that the candlesticks themselves are made of Spanish brass and are said to have been designed with a Habdalah set in mind. That they can, all of these pieces can come apart. You have a candle, and you have uh, what looks to be a cup of wine, and a spice box uh, on the bottom. Um, of late, that is what tour guides always would say uh, when I was a uh, child growing up in the synagogue. Um, well, it turns out that the making and shipping of large candlesticks like this were always done in pieces. And so you would always get, in order to be able to ship it around the country or around, you know, around the, end of the world, it would always be made in pieces that could be screwed together. Uh, and so it's not so unusual to have these different pieces. Um, and so it's likely not, you know, just the oral history, uh, the oral, oral history got aggrandized over time, likely not a converso uh, hiding of the Havdalah set here in these candles. Um, but it was a nice tale anyway. Um, anyone else hear that tale? If you, if you remember hearing that, uh, let us know. Chazan's function was to take care of the lambs. Well, already in the, in the, uh, uh, in the temple itself, right, you have the... Uh, uh, we have the, the, the setting of the candles was the, was the Kohen's job. Uh, and they would also uh, mix the incense uh, at those times of the day when they would light the candles. So yeah, it's an important job. I tell you the Shamash is always worried about the candles in the synagogue. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I wanted to talk about uh, with you. <laughs> Too good to check. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, now, I don't know how many of you have, uh, have ever seen the, these up close, but if you do, um, uh, well, well, first, well, let's go back a little bit. So candles of this size, there, was two, there were two types of lighting uh, in colonial days and in earlier periods as well. Um, and those would have been oil lamps, which were very, very common. And candle lamps, candles, candle, uh, uh, candelabrums, either hanging or handheld, uh, which were becoming more and more popular uh, in the early modern period, late Middle Ages, and certainly by the colonial period, they were quite popular. Um, our synagogue, I don't have a picture of it, I should have put it for you, but there, are, there were uh, what we call Sabbath lamps, but were really originally just uh, lighting for, the, for, for all sorts of rooms, um, were oil lamps that would be lit, have multiple wicks, sometimes six, sometimes seven, sometimes five. But we actually have two of them, one of them which is known to uh, have been used in the Mill Street Synagogue. Currently, it's on loan to uh, Beit HaTzutzot in Israel. Um, and another one of the candlesticks that you don't see here uh, is also on loan uh, to uh, the Beit HaTzutzot in Israel. So if you are in Tel Aviv, go check it out, tell us what you see. But you will see these two types of lighting of the synagogue uh, side by side, both from the Mill Street Synagogue. Now, uh, the candles that would have been used, um, candles were expensive, uh, especially if you go back to the Middle Ages or earlier. Candles would have been made out of beeswax, which was expensive, or tallow, uh, you know, fat from animals, uh, which was also not always so easy to come by. A revolution uh, begins to happen in the uh, 18th century, 17th, 18th century, and that is the use of 
whale um, wax, spermis, spermaceti candles, uh, and Jews have a lot to do, at least in the, in the colonies, with spermaceti candles. And that's my next source for you. Uh, Beit HaTuzot is now called the Museum of the Jewish People, ANU. What is ANU? Is that an acronym for something? Uh, you'll have to tell us. Um, I have seen it, but I always forget it. So uh, 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 I have to train myself to say ANU instead of Beit HaTuzot. Okay, it's not the Diaspora Museum, it's the Museum of the Jewish People. Um, so let's talk about making of candles in colonial America. It happens to be that the center of candle making was Newport, Rhode Island, and very involved in that trade were Jews. In fact, um, here I have a little, just the thing I found on the internet, but it's a good, a good summary. On April 13th in 1763, four Jews from Newport, Aaron Lopez, Naftali Hart, Jacob Rodriguez Rivera, and Moses Lopez. These are the most wealthy and important people from uh, the colony in Newport in 1763, which happens also to be the year that the Turo Synagogue is uh, consecrated. Uh, we're among the 10 signatories of the Spermaceti Candle Making Agreement signed in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, this was a revision of an agreement signed two years earlier. The agreement bound candle manufacturers to pay maximum price per ton of sperm whale head uh, and to use all fair and honorable means to prevent new rivals from entering the candle manufacturing business. Really great. <laughs> the most most feared and most targeted were whalers themselves, whom the cartel tried to pre prevent from acquiring the large iron screw presses needed to squeeze the oil out of the raw spermaceti. And and this group of ten sper uh, spermaceti candle makers from Newport endured for 12 years, at which time there were 24 signatories to the agreement. Aaron Lopez was a converso from Portugal, who became the wealthiest person in Newport and left an extensive documentation of his business life. Happens to be the Aaron Lopez papers, or many of them are located in our archives. Um, and the last quote I think is quite interesting. The art of manufacturing candles from the head matter of sperm whales began in America around 1748. It is generally agreed that Jacob Rodriguez Rivera, the Sephardic Jew living in Newport, introduced the process after immigrating either directly or indirectly from Portugal. Jacob Rodriguez Rivera actually lived first in New York and then he moved to Newport. Um, and he is uh, one of the main people who introduced the manufacture of spermaceti candles to America. Now, this is actually an important thing because um, it greatly, these candles were, were greatly sought after. They were efficient, they were cheaper to make, um, and, they were, um, and they were cleaner uh, to burn than some of the other options out there. Uh, it also led to, uh, a run on sperm whales, so uh, you know, in the end it had unforeseen consequences, but um, which only were curtailed in the 20th century. Um, but yeah, that's that's what you would have seen: uh, large wax candles, uh, at least at least after 1748, being made out of spermaceti candles, uh, probably manufactured in Newport or elsewhere in the colonies. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen these candles in the small synagogue. Uh, when I was growing up, they were never lit. When I became Shamash, I decided that we should light them if they can be. And so uh, around 2013, 2014, one year when we, we switch, now with COVID, we don't pray in the little synagogue much anymore, but um, we used to, in the, after, the, uh, after Shavuot, when the choir goes on vacation, uh, we would pray Friday night services in the little synagogue. Um, and it always bothered me that every every Shabbat during the year, we're in the main synagogue, we have the candles lit. Why don't we light the candles in the small synagogue? So I started lighting them. And then I realized after a few weeks why we don't light them. <laughs> and that's because they drip. Uh, and it's a pain in the neck to clean up. More than that, we also have air conditioning. <laughs> you can see these vents up here, which were constantly blowing out one or the other. And I was always worrying about keeping them lit and figuring out how to make it blow. So after a few weeks, I, I stopped the endeavor and I, real, I gave in to, uh, to the electric lighting as, uh, as it always been. But they, they are, there are candles in here and they can be lit. This is a picture of one of the wicks sticking out of it. Um, and you can see that these big white uh, candles, what look to be candles, are actually metal canisters. Uh, and inside is a wax candle and they're on a spring. 
so that when you light it, it keeps the candle uh, and the wick right at the top. And as the candle burns down, it always stays at that height because the spring will keep pushing the candle up and up and up uh, until it gets too small and we have to replace the candle. But there are very long candles that go about half or three quarters of the way down, um, quite expensive by the way. <laughs> Um, and it can and has been lit from time to time. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember in 2019, uh, one Shabbat afternoon, there was a blackout in the, on the west side. I think from maybe from around the 30s until the till 86th Street, until the 90s. Um, uh, uh, and there, there was a, a, a blackout right on Shabbat afternoon. Came to synagogue and I was, what are we going to do? Just as the sun was starting to set. So uh, we lit all these candles. Uh, and held services right there in the small synagogue, uh, and then told everyone to go home. <laughs> uh, but that was uh, that was an interesting uh, Shabbat. But they can and have been lit from time to time. Traveling back to get the spur. <laughs> yes. Uh, by the way, Star Trek Four is my favorite of all of the Star Trek. Take me to your nuclear vessels. But that's a that's a maybe we'll do another random walk on Star Trek and Sharath Israel. But thank you, Michael. Uh, absolutely the best uh, the best of them. Uh, or at least the funniest. Okay. Um, so the only other thing I want to show you um, is uh, the small synagogue uh, in the 19th Street synagogue. So the uh, these are the candlesticks as we see today, and they have these, like I told you, these metal canisters that keep the candle uh, inside and push them up, 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 up. Uh, but previously there was no such device. And this picture uh, is from the 19th Street Synagogue, which uh, existed from uh, 1860 until 1897. I don't know what year this photo was taken, but I'll say 1890, uh, circa 1890. Um, and they had a small sanctuary, just like we do today in our synagogue today. In the 19th Street Synagogue, they had a similar uh, small sanctuary, which, all, which had all these furniture from the previous buildings from the, from the Mill Street Synagogue going all the way back to 1730. And here you can see these candles in action um, with very large uh, wax candles uh, sitting on them. Probably also spermaceti candles. I think in the 19th century, they were still pretty popular. Okay, yeah, Lopez, uh, I think it can be, I think they weren't so medactic, they weren't so exacting on whether it was spelled with a Z or an S. And I think they could be interchanged uh, frequently on, uh, in writings of that era. Um, but yeah, so that's the only thing I want to show you that the, these uh, candles were used and even have been used even in the modern era, uh, uh, just as they were uh, when they were noted by Alexander Hamilton in 1744. That is the first half of my little presentation for you, candles of the small synagogue. Um, the can by the way, the candlesticks, maybe we'll talk about another time, the candlesticks in the main synagogue are gas. They're gas lamps that just look like candlesticks. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about those another time. Now I wanna transfer, switch to another topic, related topic. Um, and that is uh, Havdalah. So we're gonna learn a halacha. This is from Orachayim. Uh, from, this is from the uh, Shulchan Aruch. And it tells you the, the halachot of, of making Havdalah. Havdalah is the prayer that happens at the end of Shabbat uh, to separate between Shabbat and weekday. Um, thank you, Linda. Um, and it's, uh, this is the halacha. Mevarech al haner. You make a blessing on the candle. There are several items that you have to make blessings on, including besamim and wine. And you make a blessing on the candle, um, or I should say the lamp. Mevarech al haner. Borei meorei haish. The blessing of he who created uh, the light of fire. Uh, if you have one, if you have a lamp, then you make this bracha on it. You don't have to go searching for a lamp. If you don't, if you don't have a lamp at hand, you can skip this blessing and go on. And then he tells you a little more detail. Unless it's the before, then you need to go get one. Um, anyway, that's uh, that's the first halacha in talking about Havdalah, of the, the candle of Havdalah. And the second halacha, mitzvah min hamufchar. It is a um, uh, better way to do the, to the mitzvah, or a, uh, the choicest way, the, the best way to do the mitzvah is to, love, to bless al-avukah, make a blessing on a torch. 
what exactly an avuka is is uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about it, although there it's an interesting topic which we won't get too far down into. But you should make a blessing on a torch, um, and that's if you have uh, a torch and if you have a single candle or a single lamp, that's okay also. Uh, and that's what he says. And then there is a little note from uh, Rabbi Moshe Isserlist or Aga Vener Shayeshlo Shte Pitilot. A, a candle or a lamp that has two wicks, mikri uh, avuka. That's called a torch. It has two wicks. It's called a torch. And so this is what we are used to. Um, in most of our homes, you will see uh, havdalah candles that are have multiple wicks in them, just like we have here in the synagogue. Now, about three or four years ago. Uh, a great debate uh, occurred um, online. I'm a member of a Facebook group that uh, talks about Western Sephardic customs. And someone said that the Western Sephardic custom is to use a single wicked candle, like a Shabbat candle type of thing for Havdalah. There was a lot of back and forth. Some people said, no, it's in the Shulchan Aruch. You should use an Abuka. Um, someone there said, oh, an Abuka just means a wax candle. Does that mean a torch? Uh, a lot of a lot of strongly held opinions, as Western Sephardim are known to have, and I weighed in, uh, saying the custom here in Sharif Israel is to use a braided candle, um, and I showed pictures of our Havdalah set, and here is a set from uh, 1955, and people uh, jumped on me, as happens on the internet, impossible, that's uh, Ashkenazic custom, it's not Sephardic, to use a braided candle is terrible, you know, people get a little worked up on the internet. Um, as can happen, uh, but I was pretty sure that this was the custom here uh, because uh, it, the Havdalah set is pictured in Dr. Poole's book in 1955, and this, I know this Bissamim uh, case uh, goes way back to the colonial period, and I don't know the ages of the different things, but I thought this, this must have been the custom here at Sheriff Israel, uh, certainly since the 50s, and why not much earlier? I see no reason why not. I never heard of it anything different. Um, at that point, I got uh, uh, some members of this congregation uh, calling on me, Can't, <laughs> um, uh, in particular, Solomon Bastias, who told me the custom in Amsterdam to use a single Shabbat candle, and, and, and the late, great Herman Solomon, uh, who called me up and told me that uh, the custom here uh, was to use a single candle. I said, no way, I never heard of that, no way, I'm, I'm all due respect, no, not possible. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm mentioning it here is because I have to uh, uh, kind of eat my words, uh, which I will get to in a, in a minute. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what the, braid, the origin of the braided candle um, and a little, a little bit about the avuka. So uh, here I have, um, in antiquity, the common way of lighting anything in your house, lighting in a synagogue, in your home, would have been with an oil lamp. And here are many different examples of oil lamps that were found. I think this is a hoard that was found in Beit Shemesh. Uh, but you'll find similar, uh, different designs. But, you know, oil lamp made out of clay usually uh, was the most common way of uh, lighting anything in uh in antiquity, um, and that stayed the case through you know, through the Middle Ages for a long time. Um, so there is a there is a passage in the Talmud in, in Tractate Psachim uh, where it talks about Rabbi Yaakov, who visited the home of Rabbi Yaakov Bar Abba, who visited the home of of Rabbi, and uh, the, it's a long Gemara, which has lots of uh, interesting topics about how to make kiddush and uh, and whether how many blessings you need to make on on various things if you bring a new wine. So it's a long, long, long and important halachic passage uh, in Psachim, um, but it has a part that talks about havdalah. And uh, I'll just read the English to you um, because this is the, the essential part. <laughs> Well, uh, you can say that because you're his nephew. Uh, thank you, Jack. <laughs> also, Drew. Um, 
when uh, so it says kimat uh, al when when it came time for havdalah, this is Rabbi Yaakov was visiting uh, Rabbi's home. Uh, the servant went and lit a torch, an avuka mishraga, from a lamp. Uh, Amarle, so Rabbi Yaakov said to his host, says, Lama lach, why, why are you doing this? You have a lamp, that's, that's good enough. Amarle, uh, Rabbi says to his visitor, Rabbi Yaakov Rabbi, um, the, the servant did it his own. Uh, he did it on his own. He did, I didn't tell him to do this. And then Rabbi Yaakov Rabbi says, "Really? Would he would he have done it if you if he didn't know this is what you what you told him to to do? The servant doesn't act on his own. It's crazy." Ah, so then the answer. This is the end of the whole sugya here. Uh, uh, is what Rabbi uh, what Rabbi says back to him. Lo safar lemar avukal havdala mitzamin amufar. Don't you don't you believe that using a torch is the the best way to perform this mitzvah? Is the, the choicest way to perform this mitzvah? Uh, and that that leaves it. So that is why the halacha that we read earlier says that it's a mitzvah min amufar. It is the, the best way to do havdala is with a torch. Now the torch in uh, the, the days of the Talmud in Babylonia was not braided candle with two wicks. Uh, it was uh, a bundle of reeds uh, wrapped together. It's possible that they had uh, wicks that were uh, sort of like tapers uh, that were wrapped together, but wax was very expensive. It would have been beeswax and probably was not even that. Probably it was just bunches of weeds wrapped, you know, wrapped together tightly and used as a torch. And here is a, um, uh, a mosaic. Uh, I believe it's from a synagogue in Tiberia showing you an avukah. This is not, not depicting Havdalah, but it is uh, an avukah. This is a, a torch from the Talmudic uh, period, or Byzantine period. No, not Rabbi Yudanasi. Uh, that's Rebbe, that's not, not Rabbah. Uh, this is later than that. This is, an, this is a, a later period, during the Talmudic period. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, so that's that, what I'm trying to uh, point out here is that this whole discussion in the Talmud is not talking about wax candles. It's talking about uh, a lamp, an oil lamp, or literally a torch, a very large uh, uh, torch. Um, and so let's take a look, what's, what do I have for you next? So we have to, we have to dis discover how did the braided candle get used, uh, uh, become the use uh, of, uh, for Abdallah. There is an amazing article. It's called Can The Candle of Distinction. Uh, you can Google it online. You can find, you can even download it. You can download it without its images for free. If you want to get the images, it costs a lot of money. Um, but you can download the uh, article for free. Uh, and it's an amazing article. I recommend it highly called Candle, candle of Distinction. Uh, and it goes to the history of the Havdalah candle. And it's, on the left here, I think this is the oldest known uh, braided Havdalah candle. It comes from, I think, from Nuremberg or something like that. And it's actually a you know, sort of like relic that's left over from, uh, I think, the uh, 17th, uh, 1800s, from around 1750 or so. Nuremberg, uh, it's this sort of artifact, this old artifact of a, of a braided candle in a Havdalah candle holder um, but in, in Ashkenaz. Uh, in Ashkenaz and in Sarad, uh, through the Middle Ages, or certainly in antiquity, uh, uh, oil lamp was used. They didn't use uh, these candles like we have today because candles were pretty rare. Uh, as I've said, even just to home, light your home, you would have used an oil lamp uh, usually, not, not, not candles uh, until a much later period. Um, but here, take a look on the pictures on the right. These are these are um, illuminated manuscripts depicting church practices, in particular, the Paschal candle. So I am not an expert in uh, all the rites and rituals of the Catholic Church or the Christian uh, calendar, but uh, with Easter, there is, uh, I think, something called Holy Saturday, right before Easter Sunday. And on that day, they extinguish all the lamps in the church. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of lamps being lit for various purposes in church practice, and those are extinguished on Holy Saturday, and they are lit anew on Easter Sunday with something called the Paschal candle. 
And uh, back in the uh, early days of the church, that was um, would have been a, a lamp. Uh, and then it became a beeswax candle, a long beeswax candle, which was expensive and special and had symbolic meaning assigned to it. Um, and that was what was used to light all the lamps on uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, but over time, uh, by the Middle Ages in France and in Germany and in Spain, um, they started using a braided candle. And there are depictions of it um, in these manuscripts. Here's one of them here on the bottom. Here's another one here. And there's several of these depictions of the braided candle that was used for the um, uh, Paschal candle in medieval uh, Christendom. And so this article goes on to show that from there, uh, that practice of using this large candle and braided candle slowly crept into Jewish practice. And, and in general, they would make more and more of these candles would become cheaper over time. And, uh, and if you wanted to get a good candle, you would get a braided candle. And so beginning in the, uh, you know, from, from a Christian practice in the 10th and 11th century, till you get to uh, the 15th, 16th, 17th century, uh, and even in the Jewish world, now they start using these braided candles. And that, that's the general trajectory. I'll take a long article condensing it into a short period of time. Now, apparently, in Sarad, uh, they didn't start using these candles until uh, relatively modern times. Um, um, and, uh, uh, and so the, the, the start of Nashkenaz, it spread eventually to Sarad because if you go now and you, you get a Havdalah candle anywhere in any store, a Sephardic Sephardic store or uh, in Israel, everyone's using these braided candles um, uh, with multiple wicks. Uh, but it wasn't always that case, always that way. And in, apparently in Amsterdam, uh, they did and maybe still do use a single wick Shabbat candle or a long uh, taper uh, for the Havdalah, even to this day. And now we'll get to practice here at Sheriff Israel. Um, if you want to take a look at our Havdalah set, so uh, Herman Solomon called me up and told me that he knows for a fact the Kornel he died in 2021. He, he called me up in, I think, around 2019, 2018, when this debate was raging online. He told me he knows for a fact that um, that they used to use a single candle here at Sheriff Israel, not a braided multi-wick candle, because it was his father who made the synagogue switch. Then I noticed on the Havdalah set is an inscription on the Havdalah candle holder. It says, Pre presented by Ivan Solomon, the Congregation of Sherath Israel, Hanukkah 5712, which is December 1951. And so that Havdalah candle, which I showed you before from 1954, that was just uh, presented a few years earlier by Ivan Solomon. And according to his son, Herman Solomon, uh, his father made the synagogue switch from a single candle to a braided candle uh, because of the Shulchan Aruch, which says it's better to use an abuka and not a single candle, a single witch candle. Um, I, this was, you know, I, I had to accept it. It was the, the Torah, uh, Misenai from Herman Solomon, but it's not something that I ever thought of before, and I had, I had trouble accepting it without actually having seen uh, such a thing done. Uh, but then, but then I did find a little bit on the, a little bit about the Solomon family because this is, uh, 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 Sherry has uh, uh, sponsored this session uh, in, in, in honor of Carla. So um, Ivan and Sophie Solomon were uh, Dutch Ashkenazic Jews who had connections to the Sephardic world as well, who uh, in, during the Nazi period in the thirties, they. Uh, came to New York, they moved to New York, and settled here on the west side, and uh, came to Sheriff Israel. And they were very, very influential here in Sheriff Israel. Um, Ivan uh, Solomon was a philanthropic individual. He helped uh, pay for the publication of the festival prayer book when Dr. Poole, you know, the, it was the last one that came out. Dr. Poole did the Daily Sabbath prayer book, he did the Rosh Hashanah prayer book, the, the Kippur prayer book. And the last one to come out was the festival book, and that was published by Ivan Solomon. Um, 
he, he, he paid for a, a, an outdoor sukkah to be used. Uh, the indoor sukkah was a little bit cramped and maybe had some space issues. So he paid for an outdoor sukkah to be used at the synagogue. Um, he had, uh, he paid for a library, the Ivan and Sophie Solomon Library, uh, which was uh, used by the Talmud Torah School and others. So he was a very philanthropic individual and very influential in the synagogue. His son, Robert Solomon, was uh, on the board for many, many years. And Carla and Jack, who are here today, uh, are his son, uh, his children. Uh, and he also had a daughter whose name was Elf, um, whose husband, Charlie Bentham, was also on the board. And another son uh, named Herman, who I mentioned earlier, Professor Herman Solomon. So it was a large family, an influential family in the affairs of Sheriff Israel. Um, and we can talk about other things that they did ha and had influence on in other sessions, but apparently it was Ivan Solomon who, re who in enacted a change in the, in the custom of what we used to use for the uh, Havdalah camp. Now, uh, I still accepted the truth as, as, as Herman had told it to me because I had to, but uh, I still didn't sit well with me until I found photographic evidence. And that, uh, is in a book called The House of God, which is sort of like a coffee table book from the 1940s, which had pictures from churches and synagogues throughout the United States. And there were some several pictures of Sheriff Israel, including this one. Oops, wrong way. Going the wrong direction. Here we go. Um, and you can see this was published in 1946. So this is what was before. And you'll see a single long candle on a uh, candle holder of a different style than what we use now. So finally, uh, vindication for Herman's uh, memory. Uh, and this is certainly, and this is, this is Dr. Gerstein, by the way, uh, from 1946 uh, with the Havdalah set as it was used then. And so that is my whole spiel for you this evening, candles in the synagogue. Um, we saw these large, Candles from the Mill Street Synagogue and the custom of what was used for Havdalah. Uh, I don't know what that question refers to, so I'll have to hold off on that. So thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, if you have not yet re uh, recited the uh, Omer, which uh, you probably wouldn't have, it's just uh, just time now. Um, so we're going to count the Omer. Uh, and I can't be most see you over the internet, so if you want to say the blessing with me, you welcome to. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Hanolam Asher Kitishanu Ben Mitzvotav Itzivanu Al Tzirat Haomer Hayom Shivna Vengetim Yom Lang Omer Shem Shelosha Shabungot Veshisha Yamim Arachaman Yachazir Ngabodat Beit Hamikdash Nimkoma. Bimhera beyameinu, lam nateach bin ginot mit morshir, Elohim yichoneinu vivarecheinu, yair panav, itanu selah nadat, paretakecha, bechol goyim, yeshu natecha, Yodu Chang Amim Elohim, Yodu Chang Amim Kulam Yismechu Viranenu Leumim Kitish Kot Amim Yishor Kulumim Ba'aret Sanchem Sela Yodu Chang Namim Elohim Yoducha Namim Kulam Meretz Natsina Yipula Yibarechenu Elohim Elohenu Yibarechenu Elohim V'yireu Oto Kola Seyare And so that's my spiel for you today. I'm going to uh, uh, end the recording and uh, ask everyone to unmute.